is Pastor Donald Wayne Dickman here. A blessed Sunday to all of you all out there. I pray that you all are keeping well in the Lord. I also pray that you're running your race faithfully with your eyes set on Jesus Christ. Today, my message is entitled, What to do when facing the wilderness? The text is taken from Psalms chapter 63. Psalm 63 is the Psalms that David wrote while he was in the wilderness. This morning, we will examine together a time where one of the greatest men who ever lived, King David, found himself in a literal and emotional wilderness and needed to seek God. David's song in the wilderness is Psalm 63. This psalm displays David's love for God in a dry, thirsty, and hard place. In a place where the soul is either destroyed or developed. That's what a wilderness will do to you. It'll either make you a bitter person or a better person. Your soul will be destroyed or your soul will develop and you will become a stronger person. David's soul deepened with the heat of the circumstance. The natural wilderness David, David was in was also a spiritual wilderness for David. He was in a lonely, solitary, desolate, unsettled and afflicted place. It was a time with little direction as to what to do. But David found a touch of God for his soul while in the wilderness. Psalm 63 is called by many names. Some writers call it the Psalm of the Thirsty Soul. Others say it's a Psalm of a Desperate Life. A Psalm of a Satisfied Soul. A Psalm of the Wilderness Experience. A psalm of the intense longing for God. A psalm of the morning. Today, I entitled my message, What to do when facing the wilderness. So we'll look at these psalms because this is the psalms that explains, that teaches us what to do when you are in the wilderness. What are the steps you need to take to overcome this wilderness and come out stronger and better? We have two possibilities that could provide the context of these Psalms. The earlier of the two possibilities would be found in 1 Samuel 23, where David was fleeing his life from Saul. He spent much time in the Judean wilderness, as we see in 1 Samuel 23, verse 5. The difficulty that some have with this earlier dating is David refers to himself as king in these Psalms. And technically, Saul was still king of Israel. At the same time, David had already been anointed by Samuel to be king. The second possibility is found in 2 Samuel 15 and 16, where David is fleeing from his son Absalom. At this point, David is clearly king of Israel without any room for doubt. And the text itself calls him the king. David is found to spend time in the wilderness of Benjamin, which is part of the Judean wilderness. Beloved, as you reflect on these words of these Psalms, remember the context from which it comes. It is one of trust in God, even in the midst of having to flee for your life. This is an important point. As you read this Psalm 63, it's, it's a Psalms that shows David's trust in God, David's focus in God, David's yearning in God, even in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of fleeing for his life in the midst of the wilderness. Oh, how we can learn from those ancient saints who clung to these Psalms for encouragement in the midst of their great trials. Trials are not things to be feared, but opportunities for God to demonstrate his provision for us. So let's rest in God's hand for all your needs, even in the midst of great tribulations and trials. If you had to describe the society today, how would you describe it? Perhaps for the most accurate description would be uncertainty, 
fear and pressure. We live in a day marked with uncertainty. Fear and pressure is almost in every area of our life. COVID-19 has hit us and we are experiencing it for more than a year. Sickness, threats of debt, financial constraints, economic downturn, loss of employment, slowdown in business, relationship problems, addiction, habits, destructive thinking, anxiety, depression, dryness in your spiritual life, personal issues, problems with friends, problems in relationships and marriage, and all these things tell us about the society today. It talks about a time where we face uncertainty, we face fear, and we face pressure. In the, in the midst of this COVID that lasted that so far for more than a year, many marriages have been destroyed. The devil has come to destroy marriages. The devil has come to steal our peace. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So today we need to be alert as we look at these Psalms and identify certain important points that will help us on how to face the wilderness and come out victorious. In the midst of such uncertainty, fear and pressure, there is one thing that will determine the course of your life. And that is your priority. And this is the most important thing. You and I will definitely go through wilderness. Now we are going through a huge wilderness experience. Some of us have gone through many other wilderness experiences and we might face other wilderness experiences in, in later on in life. But what is most important is getting your priority right. Everyone has a set of priorities. If, you, if your priorities are not clearly defined, you will react to every situation, to every difficulty, to every wilderness experience instead of responding. You will be swept downstream in life by the situation, by the wilderness experience, by the difficulties, and will end up the victim of your circumstances. That's why I explained to you, when you go through the wilderness, you can either come out a victor or a victim. It all depends on what is your priorities. It all depends on whether you are reacting to it or you're responding to it. But if your priorities are clear, then you can respond to your challenges, to your wilderness journey, to the pressures of life by making choices in line with your priorities and thereby give direction to your life. Thus, it is crucial that you have the right priorities today. Your priorities determine how you spend your time, with whom you spend your time, and how you make your decisions. Your priorities keep you from being battered around by the waves of pressure and help you to steer a clear course towards the proper destination. Priorities, godly priorities are crucial. In this sermon, that is my point. We need to set godly priorities. And we are going to look at Psalm 63 and identify the priorities that David Use and we are going to apply it in our life. King David was a man who knew what it meant to live in the wilderness, in uncertainty, in fear, in pressure, in running for his life, in the barren land, fleeing for his life from his own son, fleeing disgrace and rejected with an uncertain future. David penned Psalm 63. It is one of the most well-loved Psalms. John Chrysostom wrote that it was decreed and ordained by the primitive church fathers that no day should pass without the public singing of these Psalms. That the importance they put in Psalm 63. It is also observed that the spirit and soul of the whole book of Psalms is contracted into these Psalms. In fact, the ancient church had the practice of beginning the singing of the Psalms at each Sunday service with Psalms 63, called the morning hymn. This Psalms is sometimes something of a climax of a trio of Psalms, Psalm 61 to Psalm 63. James Boyce said, 
Almost a love song for God is Psalm 63. J.J. Stewart said, this is unquestionably one of the most beautiful and touching Psalms in the whole Psalter. David expresses longing for God's presence, praise, joy, fellowship with God, confidence in God's salvation. But there is not one word of asking for temporal and even spiritual blessing. The Psalm shows that David's priority was to seek the law. So that is Psalm 63. Psalm 63 allows us to peer into the heart of this man after God's own heart. It's an emotional Psalm coming out of the depths of David's life and it will be an injustice to pick the Psalm apart while missing the feeling that it conveyed. The first priority or the first point I want to talk about today is as we read Psalms chapter 63, verse 1 and 2, it says, O Lord, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee, my flesh longed for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. The first point or the first priority here is to seek the Lord with all your heart. For us to go through the difficulties of life, the wilderness experience, the uncertainties, the fearful experience is for us to seek the Lord with all our heart. It's for us to get our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's what we are learning from Psalm 63. That's what we are learning from King David. Seeking after God should be our most important priority. David was in a dry, barren, waterless wilderness. The thirst in his mouth for water prompts him to thirst in his soul for God and to do so with passion. So no matter what pressures come into your life, you will be able to handle them properly if you maintain this one priority above all else. What does it mean to seek after God? What does it mean to seek after God? To seek after God means to have an intimate relationship with God. That's what David says here. He said, Oh God, thou art my God. Oh God, Elohim. Thou art my mighty God. When he writes this verse, he's showing us a personal or intimate relationship that he has with God. Oh God, you are my God. You are my God. It's personal. And that's the kind of relationship we must have. What is so important for us as we read this psalm is about relationship. It's not, a, not enough to have head knowledge. What is more important in this psalm is to have a relationship, an intimate relationship with God. And that's what seeking the Lord means here. It means that you are pressing in for an intimate relationship with God that you can boldly say, Oh Lord, my God. Or like Psalms 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. It's not a shepherd or the shepherd, it's my shepherd. Then the second Meaning to seek after God is we need to seek after God early. In Psalm 63 verse 1 says, Oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek you. We got to start our day seeking the Lord. In everything you do, the first thing is seek the Lord. In Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Some other versions of the Bible, NIV, ESV, NASV talks, they don't say early, but they say earnestly. You seek the Lord earnestly. You seek the Lord ardently. You seek the Lord diligently. That's what the second meaning is to seek the Lord. The first to seek the Lord is we seek the Lord means that we have a personal relationship with God. The second thing we seek the Lord means that you seek the Lord early. Or in other translations, he says to seek the Lord earnestly. 
Seek the Lord with passion. To seek the Lord ardently. To seek the Lord diligently. And that's what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to start every day seeking the Lord. You're supposed to seek the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Matthew 6, 33, I read to you, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 22, 37 says, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. In Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. That's what God is looking for. For a people who seek God with all. First, for seeking God, you have an intimate relationship. Second, you seek God early. You seek God, God diligently. You seek God earnestly. You seek God passionately. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 3, 16. If you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, God will spew you out of his mouth. The third meaning to seek God means to thirst after God. The Bible says in Psalm 63, verse 1, it says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsted after thee, my flesh longed after thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. This is what David is teaching us. How do we seek God? We seek God. We build an intimate relationship with God. We seek God. We have, we seek God early. We seek God passionately. We seek God ardently. We seek God diligently. And then we see here, the next one is, we thirst after God. We thirst after God. All of us need water. We can survive without food for many days, but you cannot survive without water for more than three days. Our body is such we need water. So when you don't have water, you will hunt high and low to find that water. And that's the kind of heart we must have for God. We must thirst for God. Are we thirsting for God? Or are we going to God only when we need something like he is Santa Claus to us? When our business is not doing well, when we're having a sickness, we're having a relationship problem, or we lost a job, then we go to God. Other times when things are dandy, fine and dandy, things are working out, we neglect God, we neglect church, we neglect praying, we neglect reading the Bible, we neglect seeing the pastor, we neglect blessing the church, the ministry. Why? We need to seek God as a person is thirsty and hungry. That's what he says here. He says that my soul thirsted for thee, my flesh longed for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. This is David's description of how he's seeking God. And this is, this is a description that we must have. This is what God is teaching us. When you learn to teach, when you get your priorities right in seeking God, you are going to see a miracle in your life. Psalms 42 verse 1 and 2, David again says here, As the heart or deer panted after the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee. O God, my soul thirsted for God, for the living God. Whom shall I come and appear before? That's David's heart. He's seeking for God. He's thirsting for God. He's just not simply doing a religious act. We go to church sometimes, we do it for the sake of soothing our conscience. It's not hunger, it's not thirst. We just go there because I'm a Christian and we come back and we feel we've done our duty. That's not what David is talking. David is talking for a person who got no water. He's in the wilderness. He will die without water. And with that intensity and passion, he's seeking God. That's how we are going to seek God. And when you see God with such intensity and passion, you will find God and you'll see a breakthrough and miracle in your life. John 7, 37, 38, he says, Last day is the great day of the feast. Jesus said and cried unto her, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, the scripture has said, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There was a very interesting story about Socrates. A young man ran after Socrates, calling Socrates, Socrates, can I be your disciple? Socrates ignored him and walked out into the water. The man followed him and repeated the question. Socrates turned and without a word grabbed the young man and dunked him under the water and held him down until he knew that he couldn't take it any longer. The man came up gasping for air. Socrates replied, when you desire the truth as much as you seek air, you can be my disciple. And we can learn from this. 
This is how we must seek God. We must thirst for God. We must hunger for God. One of the books, a classic books that will teach us about hungering for God or thirsting for God is written by A.W. Tozer. One of his classics, The Pursuit of God. I got this book. I got many of these books, in fact. The Pursuit of God. I think all of you have not read it, read it. If you have read it, read it again and again. We need to get such books, The Pursuit of God. We need to get Tommy Tenney's books. We need to get How to Experience Revivals. We need to get Listening to the Spirit by God and Fee. We need to learn the importance of touching the heart of God. It's not enough to have head knowledge. It's not enough to go to Bible school and fill your head with theology, fill your head with all kinds of methods of interpreting the Bible, fill your head with understanding law. We need more than that. That's important. But we need more than that for us to be touched, to be transformed, to be changed, and be used by God mightily is for us to have an intimate relationship with God. And we need to seek the Lord. And how to seek the Lord? We need to seek the Lord as a deer panted for the water. We need to be hungry. We need to be thirsty. We need to go after God. It's as if God is the only one that can quench our thirst. That's how we need to go. God is the only one. Like Jesus told the woman at the well, the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. And that's, that's the kind of intensity or desire or passion we may have toward God. Realizing that emptiness within us that thirst within us, that hunger within us, nobody else can feel, only God. And you allow God to feel it, you will be satisfied. The Bible says also in this Psalms chapter 63, verse 1 and 2, verse 2 says, To see thy power and thy glory as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. To seek the Lord, to see God's power and glory. Just how we see we read about Isaiah having a vision of God in the temple. This is what David is writing. To see thy power and thy glory, so has I have seen in thy sanctuary. He says he's, he's, he's seeking God. He's having an intimate relationship with God. He's thirsting for God. He's seeking God earnestly, diligently, with all his heart, passionately. Because to see the power and the glory, to see God's power and the glory, that's what we want. If you can see that, everything else will disappear. Every difficulty, every problem, every fear, everything will disappear. The giants become like grasshoppers because you see God's power, you see God's glory. One of the dangers we face in seminary, many people joke, they replace seminary with cemetery to to hit on a point that, that sometimes that's what happens to students instead of going and getting closer with the Lord and growing in faith, they come out more dry because of all the things they are learning there. We need to be warned about that constant academic intellectual study can rob a person of their emotional passion for the Lord and His Word. That hours after hours of Hebrew, Greek, theological study the Bible becomes a textbook to be analyzed, sermons preached for intellectual truth and right doctrine, and God becomes confined to theological and philosophical systems. All real spiritual nourishment and needs are stripped away and only intellectual truths remain. This is something that I can personally attest to and at different times during my own studies. When I did my degree in theology, Bible and theology, did my master's in theology and pursuing my doctoral studies. If you're not careful, you can come dry. If you don't choose to spend time with God, you don't choose to go into the, to the closet and pray like never before. You can come with so much of hate knowledge. If you're studying all kinds of books, you get puffed up, but you don't have that, that passion, that zeal. You don't have that relationship with God. And that's very dangerous because then you lose that passion for God. And you cannot impact people. You cannot transform life. You cannot reach out to souls. But we need more than just intellectual knowledge. We need to have a deep, real, personal relationship with our Creator. 
in every aspect of our life. A.W. Tozer said this, Come near to the holy men and women of the past and you will soon feel the heat of the desire after God. They mourned for him. They prayed. They wrestled and sought for him day and night in season and out. And when they had found him, the finding was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. Let us take heed to this as we learn about this first point about seeking God. Many men that we read in the past, many great men like Billy Graham or Reynard Bonke are people who walk very closely with God, people who had intimate relationship with God, people who shook the world where millions and millions of souls go healed, miracles after miracles after miracles because of their personal relationship with God, because they learned to seek the Lord. Reynard Bonke said, God took him from zero and made him a hero because of his relationship with God. Even Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, Paul, if you put him in our society today, he should be a man with a PhD in theology or, or in biblical studies because of all the studies he went to sitting under the feet of Gamaliel and going through all kinds of teaching from young, young days onwards. And this is what he said in chapter 2. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not in enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. That is Paul. He said, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I came to you in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. His preaching was such. A.W. Tozer said, if we only hear words, but never personally experience God himself, then we are robbed of what? We really need to flourish and be satisfied. He concludes, A.W. Tozer concludes, he says, The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into Him, that they may delight in His presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God Himself in the core and central of their hearts. Arden Autry, another scholar, of current times similarly argues the same argument. He says, the goal of reading scripture should not be only for the purpose of identifying the authorial intent or the historical meaning, but it should go beyond that where they build an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get caught up with all kinds of studies, with all kinds of, of methods, and we lose sight of the main purpose of reading the Bible is to know our God, not only to know about God, but to build a relationship with God, to have an encounter with God. The second point we learn here, a priority we learn here is from verse 3 to 5 in Psalms 63. He says, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee. While I live, I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. The second priority is we must learn to praise God. First is we seek God. I explained to you how to seek God in different ways. Second point is David teaches us is praising God. He says thy loving kindness is better than life. God's loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Praising him with joyful lips. Praise should be on our lips. We should love praising God. That's why in everything we do, we say praise God. Thank you, God. Glory to God. In, every, in all times, if it's possible, you should have praise, worship, playing while you prepare your work. Unless you are in your office, you cannot do it. But other times, have praise. We should be a people who's praising God. Why? Because thy loving kindness is better than life. If you experience the love of God, you will know that God's loving kindness is better than life. That's what he says in verse 3. 
in Psalm 63, verse 3 says, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. He says, Your loving kindness, in Hebrew is hesed, is better than life. And my response, David's response is, My lips shall praise thee. Then he says, My soul, nefesh, means shall be satisfied as with the marrow and fatness. Response, my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Verse 5. These are the two verses here we see David talking about. He says, your loving kindness is better than life. I, my lips will praise you. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness of fat and abundance. The NIV says, or riches of foods. My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Not only you praise God with your lips, you praise God with your hands in verse 4. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands to thy name. Thy loving kindness is better than life. We used to sing this song many years ago. These are biblical scriptural songs. You should not go out in time. We should keep on singing this song because it's from the Bible. We should keep on praising. We should not be moving with times and forgetting the old song and saying this old and this is you. No, no. I believe there's the Holy Spirit promises. We sing according to the leading of the Holy Spirit because the songs that's written is from the Bible. Unless the songs is not biblical at all, then you can just leave it aside. So we praise God with our lips. We praise God with our hands. The third point here is remember God and meditate on his word. The text is taken from verse 6 to 8. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of my wings will I rejoice. My soul followed hard after thee, thy right hand upholded me. So here we see the third priority or third lesson or third point that David is teaching us what we should do when we go to the wilderness experience, the difficulties of life, and we go through and come out stronger, we come out a victor, not a victim, is we need to remember God and meditate on the Lord. We need to keep our eyes on God. When David faced Goliath, his mind, his focus was on God, not on Goliath. He knew how big his God is and he looked at Goliath. No matter how huge Goliath, he is still a midget or grasshopper to his God. So we need to remember God and we need to meditate on the Lord. And here we see it states here in verse 6 and 7, met, uh, Psalms 63 verse 6, it says, When I remember thee upon my bed, I meditate upon thee the night watches, because thou hast been my help. So when he remembers God and meditates on God in the night time, he says that what? God is his help. He remembers God as God is his help. And then what else he says here? The first thing he says, I know he is my helper. David meditates on God in the night watches. Throughout the night is the idea. And he says, God is my helper. Psalms 54 verse 4 says, And behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen. The next thing we know here as we meditate on the Lord and we remember God is know that he is your protector in verse 8. In verse 8, look at 63 verse 8. He says, my soul followed hard after thee. Thy right hand upholded me. God's right hand upholded him. That means God is his protector. My, my soul followed hard after thee. Follows hard means is to cling or cleave like a husband and wife cleave to each other. That's how we meditate that God is our protector. He is our protector because you cleave with God. You cling to God and nothing can come. If God is with us, who can come against us? By his power, he upholds us. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So he upholds me. He protects me. He helps me. So when you meditate on the Lord, you remember God. These are the things that come to your mind. 
God is your helper. God is your protector. God is a God that will uphold you. And that's what we should do. As David teaches us, remember God. Meditate on the Lord. So what you can do is when you're facing your wilderness times or experience or difficulties or trials, what you can do is meditate on God. Meditate on the names of God, the description of God. He is Jehovah Rapha. The God that heals. He heals. He healed me before. He healed my friend. He heals the people in the Bible. He can. He will heal me no matter how impossible the sickness is. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is Jehovah Jireh. He supplies my need. My God will supply all my needs according to riches and glory to Christ Jesus. You, you got to continue with who God is. He is referred to Baal Perizim. He is a God that is a God of breakthroughs. He caused a breakthrough in my life. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord of hosts. He's my warrior, Jehoshua, my savior, Sozo. He came to save. He came to deliver. He came to set free. He came to bless and prosper. Sozo. We need to take time. Take time. Just write down all the different words and start to meditate and meditate and meditate. And you see something will happen within you. In the wilderness, you are going to be strengthened. In the presence of my enemy, God prepares a table for me. Hallelujah. And number four, we must have confidence in God. Confidence in God. In verses 9 to 11, it says here, But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower part of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. David expresses his confidence both in what God will do to his enemies and what God will do for him. Release your enemies to God. Don't try to take on your enemies by yourself because remember, God is there to protect you. God is there to uphold you. God is there to help you. He's there to fight our battles. Release them to God. Deuteronomy 28 verse 7 says, The Lord shall cause the enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Isaiah 54 verse 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rise up against thee in judgment shall thou condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. Release your enemies to God and rejoice in your deliverance of God. 63 verse 11 is rejoice in your deliverance with God. Notice the contrast between David and his enemies. David sought after God. David's enemies sought after him. Their intent was to destroy David. If they had been falling after God, they would not have tried to destroy David. You read history of the people who tried to destroy God's children. We learn about Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and many other people rebelled against Moses and the consequence. So God here we see very clearly destroys the enemy. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto rod, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. Remember that. God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay it. Hebrews 10, 30. For we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, said the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge the people. There is a partial justice that we see happening now. As we see here, God said that God will destroy them. Then also we know at the end of days, judgment will come upon them. You read 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 9, Matthew 13, 40 to 42. In conclusion, we are going to see here in Psalms 63, what does a person look like when they follow this wonderful instruction that David gave, these four points, lessons or priorities that David taught us, if you apply it in your life. The first thing, you have satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. My soul in Psalm 63 verse 5 says, My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. He is never complacent but satisfied. David's soul was at rest. 
even in the middle of a calamity such as this rebellion, which should push many to fall apart emotionally, David had inner peace and calm. So the first thing we learn is satisfaction and fulfillment as we apply these priorities and principles and teachings in our life, you will end up with satisfaction and fulfillment. Your soul, I'm talking your inner self, you feel sad. There's to be no a hole. There will not be a hole of emptiness. My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness. The second thing we see that will develop in us as we will develop an inner joy and praise on our lips. The joy of the Lord is my strength. My mouth offered praise with joyful lips. 63 verse 5. In the shadow of your wings I sing joy. 63 verse 7. But the kings will rejoice in God. 63 verse 11. Inner joy and praise will be upon your lips. The third, we will develop confidence in God that leads to inner stability and strength in crisis. Confidence in God. When you remember God, when you meditate on the Lord, you de develop confidence, you develop inner strength, you develop boldness, you develop strength to face all kinds of crises. And the last is you will have confidence in the presence of your enemies because you know God will come to your victory. God will defeat the enemy. So this is a wonderful Psalms that I want to encourage you to read it. I want to close with this. We need to ask ourselves here, how is it with you and God today? What is your relationship? You might say, I'm very active in church. Am I organizing all kinds of meetings? I got this meeting and that meeting. I've led people to Christ. But I'm asking you a question today. What is your relationship with God? What is your intimate relationship with God? Are you seeking God personally? Are you seeking God in an intimate way, building an intimate relationship? Are you seeking God early, earnestly, diligently? Are you like a deer or a heart that is thirsty and is panting for water. Are you so thirsty and hungry for God? That is the question we need to answer each one of us today. Do you have a hunger and thirst for God? Sometimes we can get caught up with activities and programs and we lose sight of that passion and zeal for God. Psalm 63 is all about an intimate relationship with God. Seeking God is about your heart, is your intimate relation. That's the key here for you to have victory in the wilderness is for you to have an intimate relationship with your God, with your master. And when you develop that intimate relationship and you know God, you remember God, you meditate on God, you have the confidence in you. You will praise God. With your lips, with your hands, you praise, you glorify, you worship him in the midst of the wilderness. And that's what we need to do. I once read about a very godly pastor and author. His name is Alan Redpart. I'm sure many of us have heard of him. He shared this. He said he told how he faced a time in his life when the opportunities for ministry were Greatest he had ever seen. God seemed to be blessing his preaching. It was the kind of thing every pastor prays and longs for. And then right in the middle of it, Red Park was laid up with a stroke. As he lay in his hospital bed, he asked, Lord, why? Why now? When the opportunities to serve you are so great. I'll never forget what he said next. He said to the Lord, quietly impressed upon him, Alan, you have gotten your work ahead of your worship. And we need to ask ourselves, have we gotten our work ahead of our worship? Are we sacrificing our time that we spend with God for the programs and activities? Have we lost the passion, the zeal, the hunger, the thirst for God? And today as we read Psalm 63, I pray that you get convicted and you seek the master, you seek God, you seek the shepherd. Because when you seek God, 
Everything else will happen. Everything else will come through. Nothing can hinder you. Blessings after blessings. God will satisfy your soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you. God bless you. Shalom.